All right, this is Lecture 8 for the Real-Time Digital Signal Processing Lab class at the University of Texas at Austin for the spring 2014 uh, semester. So this will be a short part one, and we'll film a longer part two uh, next lecture. So this is quantization, so we'll talk today mainly just the introduction and mic at the uniform, amplitude quantization, and we'll move on in part two to audio, quantization error analysis, and noise immunity and communication systems. All right, so let's talk about sampling and quantization together for, for just a second. So let's do, let's do sampling here. And we'll do sampling and quantization, actually, in this slide. So for this interesting effect in the human visual system and the human auditory system, both are really fascinating. In the human eyes, um, Again, so in the human eyes, we have in our in our retina, we have a fovea, which is very highly dense, very dense concentration of photoreceptors. And away from the fovea, we have essentially an exponential decay in the density of these photoreceptors as a function of distance away from the fovea. And of course, there is a blind spot in there as well. So the photo, so it's kind of interesting. So if you think about this in terms of spatial resolution, what your eyes uh, really actually see is wherever your point of focus is, you get a high resolution, the highest resolution possible in terms of sampling. Right? And to give you an idea physically how big that is, if you hold out your thumb at about 30 centimeters, uh, you end up with about your thumbnail in size. That is where you're where you're dense, where you have the densest sampling. Away from that, it's an exponential decay. So one way to model this in an image, think about this as an image being really captured uh, by a camera, then what you get is the next kind of radial, radial uh, radius out, you really, this block right here is really an average of, of these four tinier pixels. You, don't have, you just don't have as many receptors. So you get less a resolution there. And, if, and the farther you out, farther you go away from the fovea, the less spatial resolution you have. So the way we could implement this in practice is to take an image that is sampled uniformly and group and let the, wherever the point of focus is, be unchanged, and then take the next group of four here in the corner and average the four pixels together to get one, one pixel. And then out here we might average, instead of four by four, two by two, this might be really a four by four of the smaller, of the smallest uh, spatial sampling possible. So just average over that four by four to get one value. So you get a blurring effect away from your, your point of focus. And you can just, you know this from, from your own experience. Um, so if you, and if you look at, so in order to figure out what's in a room, you, you look around and you build up very quickly a high resolution map of, of what's going on by focusing in different parts of the room. That's called a saccadic pattern as your eyes wander through through a 3D space. Now, this is uh, sampling. Now, in terms of responding to intensity of light, we actually respond logarithmically. Right? So we have the ability to see in very bright light conditions and also very low light in, in dim, dim nighttime. And those are two different parts of the visual system that well, one at low light, one at, one at very bright light. But together, they give us a very wide range of intensities that we can we can see. So so what does this mean? It means that our sampling here is not uniform in space and the amplitude response is not uniform either. It's logarithmic. It's a dB scale if you want to think of it that way. Now the human ears are kind of interesting. Um, they have you know, some very interesting features to it. One, the one we've talked about already is that there is a there's certainly a range of, of hearing for what we call them, uh, on average, normal hearing. Some people can hear outside this range. And as you get older, you tend not to hear so much on the high end. This high end comes down with, with age. But, but generally, this is for you know, normal hearing. It's a range that a lot of consumer audio is designed for. Now, that's kind of, so we had a range of frequencies. These are temporal frequencies that we know we can respond, that we normal hearing, normal hearing responds to. Uh, and it turns out that in terms of intensity, 
the intensity is not responded to uh, uniformly, which is good because, it, again, it lets us hear in low, low sound levels and high sound levels. And this range is amazing. This range is roughly 120 dB. It's an incredible dynamic range from very loud to very soft. Now, what's also interesting is that the way that our ears understand frequency content, we don't uniformly sample that either. It's not that we have hearing that's as, as accurate at high frequencies as low. Right? So we have more accuracy at low frequencies and less accuracy at high frequencies. So you can model, so one way to model that is in the frequency domain for hearing. Our auditory system is kind of interesting. We have a peak response at about one kilohertz. And it's less on either side of that point. And then in terms of resolution, we can basically hear frequencies in smaller bins for lower frequencies. So you know, I'm just giving you an idealized version of this, not one entirely 100% accurate. But we do have octave spacing in our hearing. And so it means as we go up in frequency, the bandwidth is wider. We don't have the, the narrow uh, frequency resolution that we do at lower frequencies. Our speech tends to be uh, below 6 kilohertz in spectral content. Most of the energy is below 6 kilohertz. In fact, you could argue most of it's below 4 kilohertz. But in terms of audio, percussion and some other harmonics are out all the way to, to 20 kilohertz. So if you were to plot you know, a response to the human auditory system, you could do a log-log plot, which is logarithmic in frequency and logarithmic in amplitude. So dB in amplitude, if you will. So in filter design, we use both linear units for pass-band, stop-band, and dB. So the reason for dB, this is one of the reasons because of hearing, but there's another reason, which is how we talk about quantization error, and that's coming up in part two. So again, this is a quantization lecture, so the context, so one context of quantization is in analog to digital conversion. Another example would be decision devices or decision blocks in our communication receiver. We have to quantize to the nearest symbol amplitude value. Lots of uses here for quantization. In the context of analog to digital conversion, our quantize, this is the theory now, our quantizer in theory is the last thing that happens. On practice, it isn't. It's a little more complicated than this. But in theory, we have an analog low-pass filter, as we've talked about many times, to perform really anti-aliasing to enforce the sampling theorem. So we have an anti-aliasing low-pass filter, a sampling block, and a quantizer. And in the output here, we're going to quantize to some level of some number of bits. And that's fixed. Now, in theory, so we look at the theory of this, and we have a cascade of really systems of different properties. Right? So I have my analog low-pass filter is going to be LTI, provided the initial conditions are zero. My sampling, so let's go ahead and fill that out. So the system properties for the low-pass filter, it's linear, it's time invariant, causal. I hope so. It's got to build this thing. I mean, occasionally we use non-causal processing, and image, like image processing, but memory? Does this thing have memory? Filter? Yeah. OK, good. All right. In theory, it has memory. In practice, it has memory. OK. Now, the sampler is kind of interesting. Um, system property. Is it linear? Uniform sampling. OK. so. Yeah, the answer is yes. So if I have an all zero input and I sample that, I get all zero output. So that's good. It might be linear. And if we go through, if I add two signals of the input and I sample, I get this, some of the sampled versions. So yeah, I'm good. This is a good thing. So yeah, I'm linear. Time invariant. If I have a shift at the, what does that mean? If I have a shift before sampling, do I see the same shift on the output? Yeah, no, it's not. So why is no? Sample different points. Sample different points. Remember, sampling is going to be picking off instantaneous values. 
All right, so from sampling, I'm going to pick off instantaneous values of some signal. If I shift it just a little bit, I pick off something very different in the signal, not a shift on the output. I, I see a completely different part of the signal than sampling, unless my shift is an integer multiple of the sampling time. For that special case, then I do see a shift on the output. But, for, but remember, for time invariance, it has to work for all possible shifts. And again, the way to think about this is do, is do this completely in continuous time, the analysis for time invariance for a sampling. So that's a no. That is a no. Causality? In practice, yes. In theory, no. We can sample all the way back to minus infinity. So in theory, I guess it could go either way. Yeah, right. So we're, we'll go with causality on this one. And memory is interesting. Depends, right? If it's an instantaneous snapshot, there's no memory. But in practice, when I sample, I average over some small interval in time, the amplitude value. So you could argue either way. But then you have to average over it. So you have some, you feed a capacitor with a small, you know, RC system, you know. So you're, you have some memory in there, and then you can reset the, drain the capacitor. So in practice, yes. So we're going to go with practice on this one. But in theory, no, because you're taking instantaneous snapshots. Quantization, um, linear? Think about one bit quantizations, as severe as it gets. Not very linear. I scale the input, I don't, if my output's only plus, or mi either plus one or minus one, I scale the input, I don't get a scale on the output. I don't have two choices on the output for one bit quantization. It doesn't pass the all zero test. Or, you know, whatever. Okay, so this is a no. Get a no on that one. Time invariance? Oh, but let's take the quantization without sampling. Let's just say that we get, you know, yeah, so if I shift the input, continuous time, just for a second, shift the output. If it's, if it's discrete time, as I have here, and I shift the input, I'll shift the output. We're good there. And again, causality, and then memory is a matter of, of implementation, but we're gonna, when we implement, we tend to go with memory on a quantizer. All right. This last comment is uh, the one thing I took an 8 a.m. class in graduate school once. I made the first lecture. In the first lecture, I remember this because I didn't make this because the professor locked the door at eight. So I didn't. I made it 8:05 the second lecture, and I dropped the class. But I remember this from the first, the very first, uh, le the one lecture I made. Quantization is an interpretation of a continuous quantity by a finite set of discrete values. So here we're talking about amplitude quantization. The quantization can be applied to frequency values, phase values, like we do in phase values for phase shift keying. It could be for, you know, frequency values for frequency shift keying, Bluetooth, whatever. There are lots of different ways we can quantize, not just amplitude. But for us, most of our quantization, uh, for A to D is going to be amplitude, but in, you know, in QAM, we quantize uh, really amplitude and phase. We do QAM transmission. So quantization has a larger definition, but here we're talking about amplitude quantization in this slide. Okay, we'll pick up with part two on next time.